Welcome everyone um, to our Raspberry Pi Foundation Computing Education Research Seminar Series. Um, my name's Sue Sentence. I'm from the Raspberry Pi Foundation and I'm delighted to be chairing this session with um, Carson, Yannick and Lucas, who I'll be um, um, introducing in just a moment. Um, this is the second seminar in our series on the theme of AI, machine learning and data science. And this series will be running monthly until March 2022. And we have an amazing international program of speakers um, lined up. Um, you probably all hear here because you know um, AI, machine learning, data science have had a huge and growing impact on our lives. And we believe it's really important for young people to understand both the technical aspects and the implications of these new technologies. And we're delighted to be presenting this series in partnership with the Alan Turing Institute, um, which is the UK's National Institute, Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. So let me explain a little bit about the session today. Um, in a moment, we'll hand over to Carsten and his colleagues, and we'll, they'll give us a 35, 40 minute presentation. Then we're going to split into breakout rooms for 15 to 20 minutes to discuss in small groups, and then we'll come back together for our Q&A. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Carsten Schult, Yannick Fleischer and Lucas Hoper from Paderborn University in Germany. They're speaking to us about exploring the data driven world, teaching AI from a, and machine learning from a data centric perspective. And they're going to talk about whether AI and machine learning should be taught differently from other themes in CS. Um, all of them work in Paderborn. Uh, Carsten is a professor of computing education research. Yannick is a PhD student in math education research. And Lucas is a PhD student in computing education research. I'm completely delighted to have Carsten here, who I've known for 10 years and one of the first people I met in the um, computing education community. And without further ado, I'll hand over to all of you. So um, I'd like to talk today about um, our approach to um, yeah, teaching AI and ML from what we've called it data-centric perspective. Um, the ideas presented today are, um, yeah, born in, in our so-called ProDebi um, context. Um, you, you see here, and again, uh, well, I'm Carsten and Yannick and Lukas, we're here, but there's also Rolf, Daniel, Sven and Susanne in that project. And um, we started with a symposium uh, where Sue also attended in 2017 uh, to, yeah, get some ideas on um, on the topic of data science at school and, and how to be able to incorporate it. And um, after that, we started our project um, with the idea to develop a curriculum. And you see on, on the right, the, the things you have to, or you can think about when designing a curriculum. So what are the aims and objectives? What is the content? What are suitable learning activities? the roles of teachers. And at first we really focused also on, uh, or quite a lot on developing materials and, and resources. And we really have problems where to find the time at school and the right uh, location. And we started with a project course. I will talk about it a little more in, on the next slide. But today I try to talk about the rational, the thing in the middle. So why, do we do it the way we do and what's behind it? And I try to present first the, yeah, this framework or, or at least some glimpses of the framework and then make it more concrete with um, three examples I try also to present. Um, so our project course uh, started at the end of our school time here in Germany. at the end of um, upper secondary. Students are then, 18 year old and it's a course that has three hours per week and it lasts for one year and um, so there you see we try the green things to do it project based and inside have some modules to teach um, yeah, some, some basics and so the idea is um, explaining how to explore data 
um, get then two different ML techniques and then in a project to, to apply the techniques. This is now the, I think the fourth uh, repetition and that's the, the current state. And in addition, we derived some, we call them standalone modules uh, for grade eight or nine. Then students here in Germany are about, I don't know, 14, 15, 16 years old. And it's first an introduction to data science, how to analyze, organize, make sense of data with a, a educational tool called CODAP. And the data we use is from a kind of a panel or a regular national survey about young people, their internet and media usage. Um, after that, we go on and explain, or as you see with the slides, they are independent, but you can use it in after one after another, but I'm not sure if there's enough time in eight, nine. So another module is to explore data, um, maybe data, um, from, from some sensors and um, analyze them in, in Jupyter notebooks. Then we have also kind of condensed uh, thing about decision trees and neural networks and data awareness. So when you take a closer look here, it's a project course, it, it fits to the um, talk we, we heard last year. We always try from the beginning to include this societal ethical aspects and and at first we had the idea after the project to, to have then ethical reflection, but it turned out really problematic to have time when we are in the focus of yeah, doing some project work. So we have included in, in the blue things and also in the green things, some ethical or societal reflections, but we don't as yet had some ideas to really include a thing about ethical aspects and that's the data awareness we are now developing from you know eight nine and then maybe it can go into the project course later on or also where we are also active right now further below because in our uh, local state here north rhine westphalia as of this um, school year uh, computer science is for the first time a mandatory subject and when the curriculum was designed, <clears throat> we were um, able to, yeah, influence is a wrong word, but uh, we, we gave our ideas. And interestingly, the topic of decision trees, not decision trees and neural networks together, but decision trees in a special variance are now mandatory module and also a module on data awareness. Well, in, um, in between, uh, in 2019, there was a science year with a topic artificial intelligence, and there we uh, designed the use um, activity and um, designed a, a game, which I will also present today. So, but let's remember, I try also to, to talk about the rational, our ideas, and yeah, let's start with, uh, with this. Um, Thing you may have heard, I think it's quite popular, well, in Germany and probably in the UK also. It's about ideas, not about artifacts. I think uh, this term was used, uh, no, probably not for the first time, by Janet Wing in the, her article on computational thinking. And it makes sense. So in all of these decades, I think in Germany, it started around 1970s. Um, we had different ideas what and how to teach computer science at school or informatics at school. And in a way, it was always a little bit more well, zeitgeist driven or dependent on the current uh, technology, the, the current ideas and buzzwords. And I think from the, I don't know, maybe somewhere here, you when you dig deep, you, you find already AI, um, as a topic for, for local schools that went then away and that wasn't an uh, uh, interesting topic anymore. And we had also this AI winter in, in science. So it seems to make sense to focus on the long lasting ideas and not on the artifacts. But actually um, our group, well, uh, at least I, and I think many here, um, 
think that's not the very best solution. So at least we, we should get rid of this not artifacts. Um, one thing that was also paper you may have um, read bef before these um, session was uh, published in 2019 um, by a bunch of uh, prominent researchers in nature. And they suggested we need something like a new research field, machine behavior, because these current ML systems or AI systems, they are so deeply ingrained in our everyday lives, in, in our interaction patterns, that it's not easy to say upfront how they are working, what are their effects. And so we can study individual machine behavior of the collector. And that's, I think, for us, the most interesting aspect, the hybrid human machine behavior. And you can also do it on a more local level. Or in other words, focus on the artifacts, focus on the concrete instantiation and on the concrete places or, or technologies where people can go and uh, meet or see um, AI technologies. Um, we call our educational framework the hybrid interaction system. The idea is to focus on humans and on the technology and best in this middle part where the interaction between a human agent and a um, yeah, computational system, uh, digital agent, or we, we call it digital artifact, takes place. And um, start here and probably start by the human being. What's our role when we interact uh, with a system? So with uh, Douglas Rushkoff, you can say there are only two choices. Either we are those who can and do program how the artifact behaves, or not, then somebody else um, has done it for us. And then we can just follow the options uh, made available by the programmer. And Rushkov says it's a program or be programmed. So that could be a first thing to focus on, on our role. But also, um, because it's not about usage or something, it's, it's meant on, a, on another level that can only be really understood when you also are able to, to see this, this pattern and therefore the role of the artifact. Uh, is it used to for automation, for example, to replace activities usually a human has done? Or is it some kind of enhancement or augmentation? Or is it a close human machine um, symbiosis and interaction where what is happening can only be understood when you reflect on this should be the gray box on the yeah, human computer, the hybrid system, where humans are shapers of technologies and by shaping technologies are also shapers of their lives, of the way they can act, but also are being shaped by the artifacts we are living with or living by. Um, I think it makes sense to take a closer look because we're computer scientists and not psychologists on, on this part. And there it's interesting to distinguish between architecture and, and relevance. And um, where well, the picture is very coarse grained, but uh, when you think or see on, on the left, these two um, gears in the gearbox, so they have the same size. Um, well, that's the architecture perspective. I could explain it and probably explain that when one thing moves, the other also moves, but why? Maybe the idea is, I don't know how a gearbox works, but I think when you rotate the lower, then the upper moves in the other direction and both are of the same size. So the idea is probably to, to not change the speed of, of something, but to change the direction. And, and those interpretations are then what we call relevance. It's the, the meaning, why it's done the way it is done, what should be um, reached by it. So it, this is connected to the human or social environment. There are the goals, the uses of a system. And so you have to see both aspects. But of course, I think I, I try to explain 
that, that the relevance aspects are not only in, in the part of the human user, but you can take a closer look inside the system and there think how does it work and why does it work that way? It's not only that you have a black box picture of the architecture and then you go outside like the socio-technical system as, as a term um, may suggest that there's on the one hand technology and on the other hand, the society. This idea is you can go deep into some details and there also you have architecture and, and relevance. So, and what that's a topic today is a different architecture and therefore the different relevance of AI technology. And I think it, it can be described by, it's not only here the gearbox, this should be a picture of the algorithms, but it's also working with data and the data are a model of the world, a trained model, which is also influencing how the system works and by usage or by new data that's um, given by, by using the system, the system changes while it's working. So it gets more complicated and it works in a different way and it's built in a different way. So here with a gearbox algorithm example, that's a, the typical what we teach at, at um, school. So we, we have a problem and, and try to design the correct solution. And that is we design an algorithm that uh, transforms some input data or inputs in, in the desired output. In on, and in order to do so, we have to understand the problem, derive a solution, and then when it's done, we are also able to understand the solution. But in ML system, it's more like we feed data in a machine learner, and this machine learner then provides us with a model, which is able, or a model plus a small algorithm that uses the model, oops, sorry, um, with a model that transforms X in, in, into Y, so the input and the output. So, but what's missing here is a deep understanding of the problem in terms of the human problem solver, the steps to derive a solution and hence also the solution itself is not understood just because I used a machine learner. So that's one major change. Another major change is accuracy. Usually I think we think of our algorithms as being the problem solution. And here is a typical Hello World example, the, the MNIST um, data where the task is to um, infer from this small graphics what uh, number is, is meant. And here on the Wikipedia page, so here are the error rates for different solutions. So it is quite usual that these things are not perfect. They have some errors inside. And also, um, I think I have already hinted at that, the role of the code is, is different. So the role of the algorithms or the ML code. Here, according to a well-known paper by Scully, um, the, the, the code is only this small black box and around it is a lot of other issues and um, aspects to be thought of. And yeah, as we are having in the title of our presentation, the data plays a major role. So when you take a look, also look at the data here, for example, with um, a rising idea to, to design a, um, a, a curriculum, just not the details, but the steps. So what is the role of the data, a conceptual framework, how to collect data, how to manage your data, how to evaluate the data, and how to apply data are major steps. And I think this role of data, role of code, different um, problem solving process that requires a change in, in teaching. And we think that our idea of this focusing on the interaction in a hybrid interaction system and therefore on the role of a digital artifact makes um, good sense in, in, in this area. And now I try to um, quickly present three examples. Let's see if that works. Um, the first example is from the um, scientific year or yeah, the, the um, use actually, 
we, we had some material for teachers and also for, for learners. Um, and here you see the, 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 the game plan. Um, it's, it's based on, on this um, matchbox computer. Um, I think Donald Mitchie built it. You can read more about it here in, in Wikipedia. So there are here you can see the, the, the playing field is there on each matchbox, that this one here. And then it, each box represents some moves you can make. And here, this is also a very nice implementation, the sweet learning computer, where the different possible moves here indicated by these colored uh, arrows are um, presented as uh, colored suites. And the system learns when a human player does something and the system reacts. Here, for example, if the system um, uses the, the move and goes here, then probably it's the only possibility left for the human player to go there or there, and then the human player has won. So this is a bad move, then eat the sweet, and next time the machine does not make the same error. Um, you, you can, ah, yeah, we have an English version now of all the materials. Only parts of here, but you, you can download it and, and build it and try it out for yourself. Uh, one part of it is that we designed, um, well, the machine part that trains or, or learns the model so that the machine can train in a very detailed, complete way. So it's a complete algorithm. There's no interpretation needed. And the different colors here indicate you can play it with different roles and a different number of uh, players for, for each set so that the whole class, either it's 21 or 22, um, can can play the game but here for now for for my thing only a short um overview is needed you we don't have to go into the detail how it's played um it's just when you see the hexapawn you, you can um go straight ahead or um capture a um, figure of your uh, opponent diagonally that's are the only possible moves and you have one when the opponent is blocked, when you are reaching the baseline or when every piece is captured. And then you can play it. So one student sits here and plays the human. And then you hear you place the figures. The others are playing the machine. And this is a visualization of the machine. And one aspect is if a human has done a move in the first Thing only these two answers of the machines are possible, and probably uh, the human player has moved this piece. Then the system analyzes, or yeah, our computer analyzes it and gets this situation card and has only two options to move here or here. This would be the symmetric case we excluded to make this move over you shorter. So it's only blue and red possible. And if you Therefore, you, you go and uh, select one of these cards arbitrarily, so by, by chance, and maybe the system selects um, yeah, the, the blue one, but the blue one makes it system loose, then it will be deleted um, for the next time, and then a new game starts, and when you play and play and play, you, you see that all the move making the system loose are um, getting wiped out. And the, the school kids should make a notation of what's happening in each round and have to play at least 10 rounds. And then the model changes. And if you play it long enough, there are no moves left here. The system would do it to, to lose. So it's um, always winning. So that's basically the, the whole thing. What have we learned? Um, when we play it with different groups, um, they do not often, as a human player, chose the best um, moves. So we have at the end different models, or in, in our language, so different input data goes to, to different um, models. We have also seen the learning or the training process probably better. Um, the machine just follows rules, so you can ask your, your student that have well, some machine players 
they do not have to be intelligent or make some inferences. They just follow rules. It's just a mechanic system. It's slow, so lots of data. Here, lots of games are needed to, to increase it. And in this case, the machine learns only when it has lost. So often, at least one or two kids in the class say, ah, that's strange. So I can beat the system when I'm in the training phase, just uh, play very dumb. And then when it's a real game, then I show my moves and the system does not have a chance. Um, but you can also shape the learning process. So ideas our kids had were, for example, when um, the human did not make a mistake, but still the system makes a, a good move, then we increase the probability by just adding an extra button in the same um, color. So the next time two cards for the good move and for the bad move that wasn't deleted, only one at there and so, by this, we can also shape the probabilities so that also the system learns. Okay, you might ask yourself now, hmm, Carsten started with the idea um, of putting artifacts in the middle and not um, ideas or concepts. And this is a, yeah, the regular um, unplugged activity to, to show some concepts. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in a way it is. But we can try to link it to, to artifacts. Although if we don't do it, there's a nice paper from uh, here, Gregor Grosse-Bölting and Andreas Mühling. They used this game. I think they made a somewhat um, smaller version with, with less fine-grained rules. But anyway, they um, used it with several school classes and then asked the students well, have you learned something that, for example, can be applied to autonomous cars? And well, I go quite quickly, you don't have to, to read it, maybe you can read it later. Um, the first thing they said is, well, uh, a, a real car is way more complex, that must work somewhat uh, differently, it cannot be this way. And here in the game, when you make mistakes, okay, that's not a problem. But in, in the traffic um, or in real traffic with real humans, um, technology can't be or, or should do, shouldn't do some mistakes. So it must be quite different how uh, cars drive autonomously. And I think we should help students in um, applying it to, to real um, digital artifacts. And I think what's here on the right, that should be a kind of summary. I hope I said it all basically. It's focusing on, on the data aspect and everything here, I think can also be applied to autonomous cars. They are also trained and uh, the humans who are um, supervising or, 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 or program the, the, the training can, can shape it. It's a mechanic thing. The system just follows rules. It does not really understand that there's a human being or an, 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 an animal or whatever crossing the street. Um, it does not know what it means. You also have to have lots of data and good data to, to have a good model quality and I think then it is possible to learn something from these concepts that you can apply to your everyday experiences um, or questions you have how the system works. Of course the ML code is quite different here but the, the process I think is similar. Okay let's go um, to the next example. It's about uh, decision trees. We used um, fruit as um, field to introduce decision trees. So maybe even in grade five, not maybe, they will be introduced in grade five, six, and probably with these data cards uh, we invented. So you see here an apple and, and a popcorn, and then you can think about what is a food you should eat and what's a, food that's probably not so recommendable. And uh, here you can see the um, 
important aspects. So like how many energy, how many um, fat, and um, I think this is called saturated fatty acid, uh, uh, carbohydrates and thereof sugar and protein and salt is included. And we have uh, yeah, several of these um, cards and then you can take a look at the individual cards and think about, okay, I think an apple is advisable and label it as that's good, green. Or mm, popcorn, maybe you shouldn't eat that too much. And you can do it with um, yeah, all the cards or, or with a subset of the cards and then you can um, sort them here. They are sorted according to the energy in included. And then you see here in the middle, that's a possible um, split. So maybe around 260, I don't know what this is. Um, and then you have on the left side, the, the good ones and on the right side, the other one, that's your first data split. And you can also see it as a tree. So then we have the first decision made in, in our decision tree. So or make it more abstract. So here rather recommendable and here rather not recommendable food is, but probably that's, not true for other food than the, those we, we selected. Maybe there's better splits. You can test it and then try it here, for example, with sugar. It's not here complete the same, but here when it's so messy, you can include a, a second um, decision and then you can this way or, or by, by going this way, you can construct your tree. So that's basically is the idea when you we go in, in um, um, further or deeper in with the older kids. We, we can also support it by some, some digital materials where you can digitally then make this labeling and that's then digital data. And then you can see how a program constructs a tree and then later on learn also the algorithms that um, produce such a tree. But here I, I want to focus again on some aspects where and first, Ah, same problem with my, my example, where is the digital artifact? I promised to, that's an important thing. Well, I think the artifacts are right here. So data is also artifacts. It's also something designed. It, it has some architecture here. You see below the attributes. You can see it maybe as an object with some attributes and attribute values. And it's done for a purpose. So we can think about the relevance. And here, when you think about this picture, I think it's interesting to think about that this is also not like a picture of the world, it's a model of the world that's designed as the term artifact should imply. And when in this model are some errors, then here this split makes no sense. For example, when these values here are wrong and yeah, well, that's why you should have brought an apple. I don't know if, if it's possible to see. This is my apple I'm having here. I don't know if the pictures are very good. So how on earth has a, an apple fed of 0 0.2 grams or 11 grams sugar? Is that really true for all apples? And how do we come to this thing? So there's a, such a great variability. That's the first thing I think interesting to, to note that impacts how we should also interpret and work with the results. But there's even more problems. For example, we are interested in recommendable or not recommendable um, decisions that our a tree makes for us or the, the app later on. And, um, when we have, for example, allergies here again from Wikipedia screenshot against milk or what others, maybe that's way more important to include here in the model if there are some allergens in, in the food or not in order to label it as um, good or not. Oh, by the way, the labeling itself, I don't know. I, I said at the beginning, we just leave it to our school kids to, to label it. We could also ask some experts, but maybe there's some bias in, 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 in labeling. Maybe there's not only the, well, healthiness. I think that's in a way also we say recommendable, not recommendable, it's a tricky thing. 
um, that um, impacts the model. So in order to be recommendable or not, we are using proxies. We cannot measure recommendable or healthy food as such. And there's also a source of error. So I think several places that can be used to reflect on the role of the data. I try to summarize it here, maybe only this thing again, what we have learned here, I call it code is cruel. Um, the decision tree just works. It's correct when the thing is labeled as it is and we use the data as it is, then it gives us a decision. But the decision is just made on this tree and there could be tons of um, problems within. So, okay, I try to be even quicker so that I can also explain the last example. Here we really start with a digital artifact. Um, it's a mobile phone network. And what happens when I um, try to call another phone so that it rings? Of course, there is some data. So the phone number I type in. Um, well, but here I try to, maybe that's also quicker to, to explain it from, from the end. And we try to teach data awareness. So what is data awareness? That's focusing in the interaction on the possible data flows that are included. Of course, I know I type in the number when I um, um, make a phone call, but there's also, or not also this explicit data, also some implicit data. For example, the time when I did it will also be recorded and other data too. And that data will then be used and processed and probably also some models will be derived from it and this usage can also be done for primary or secondary purposes. So in case of the mobile phone network, primary purpose is clear to establish a connection. Secondary purposes may not be. Yeah, of course, the mobile phone company wants to send me a correct bill. Therefore, data has to be saved. But with the data traces, we can also do something completely different. And that's data awareness, to be able to step out of your interaction pattern, which you can see here on the left and think about the whole system. And in the teaching, we do it, um, well, here's just, uh, again, what I told you was primary, secondary purpose. And this is a strange thing you can do with the data because the data is done or given by human beings. Maybe we can reflect the data or analyze it in a way to get ideas about this human being. So in our teaching units, that's exactly what we try to do. We start by experimenting. So make a connection. When is the connection lost? Whatever, some experiments in order to shift the um, attention, not to the communication, but to the protocol behind. And then we go into the details of the architecture of the mobile network. And then we learn that so location data um, is the implicit data that's collected. And then we use this location data to design a digital doppelganger and reflect on it. So when Alice tries to call Bob, um, the signal will be routed directly to Bob and not also to Cleo because the system knows that Bob is here at this um, base station. And therefore, location data is constantly recorded. And this location data can be used here. Sorry, in, in, in German, but here on the right, you can see the, the GPS data. That's some real location data. So we designed an app which you can use to filter this data. For example, in the middle of the night between 2 AM and 4 AM, maybe what do we say, PM in your, I don't know, you, you know what I mean, when people usually sleep. And then probably if it's always the same, the person lives here. And you can use this filter to get any more other ideas, maybe the job or whatever. Here's some examples. Our school kids should build a data poster, make some kind of um, image of, of the person and what they had on ideas. It's a male person, it's about 40 years old. It does not have kids. Here you can think about how they got this. It's a person that loves ice cream. Uh, something it's working as a politician, as a priest, as a trucker, as a lawyer. So politician because it's 
always near the parliament as a priest. It's often near some churches of the same religion. As a trucker, it's often near um, grocery stores, so probably it delivers something to grocery stores. Or it's a lawyer, it's a different places, but always in Germany. And if it would be a businessman, it would also go outside of Germany, but it stayed only here. That's all different doppelgangers. And between the different groups, these doppelgangers are, um, well, also different. That gives way to, to reflect on the architecture of the pattern of, of what we got and think about our interpretation. And often our interpretations are based on our personal beliefs and circumstances. So um, on a more lower level, be aware that there is explicit, implicit data and um, direct and indirect uh, possibilities and also the possibilities of the digital doppelganger and, and processing the data. And yeah, we think that it's part of what we call building. Here's a summary of um, what can be learned um, or what's important in the data. So I think I set this basically all. So I try to close with this here. So I think our position, our rationale for AI education could be that it requires developing an adequate picture of the hybrid interaction system, a kind of data-driven emergent ecosystem, which needs to be made explicit to understand the transformative role, as well as a technological basis of these artificial intelligence tools and how they are related to data science or the role of data. Here on the left, our data awareness and our interaction system, and here on the right, from some people more from the subject. Okay, that's from me. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Can we give um, Carson a, a jazz hands or virtual clap? Um, very, um, very interesting. Um, so we're going to go into some breakout rooms now um, to give you a chance to talk about what you've been, uh, what you've oh, heard so and to formulate questions. Sorry, Carsten. Uh, so I have also three questions. Oh, Yeah, go on then. What are they? Okay. But I don't know if you have to present, but the first question would be, um, yeah, what's with this ideas, not artifacts, or maybe ideas and artifacts? How should we design the relationship between ideas and artifacts? Mm -hmm. And the second question, in what aspects and yeah, how deep or how much do we need to reinforce all the time and all the examples, the role of data in contrast to the role of algorithms? And does that really mean that we have to change our typical teaching pattern? or is it natural? So from, I think that requires a, a shift in, in, in our educational thinking about computing education. So is there a different teaching pattern needed for AI? I think that's, um, yeah, really good for us to think about. Yeah, so, um, so our Carsten's asking us to think about ideas or artifacts the role of data compared to the role of algorithms, if I get all this right, and um, what we need to teach differently when we're, when we're thinking about these topics. So, um, so we'll break into groups and then we'll come back. And by then, hopefully you'll have formulated some questions for Carsten, also for Yannick and Lucas to be able to answer some questions. Um, and uh, we'll see you back then shortly. Thank you very much for coming back. And now we're going to move into questions for um, Carsten, Yannick and Lucas. I was going to start by asking, I can ask a question from me. Um, so my question was, I saw at the beginning of your talk, Carsten, you said that you were trying these things out with 14, 15 year olds. Um, have you thought about, have you had got any um, feedback from whether the, some of these topics looked quite challenging to me? We don't teach them in the UK. Have you got any feedback about whether the, the level of difficulty is, is um, okay for that age group or are you still evaluating it? Um, yeah, what, what we're doing is so like when we, we started with uh, upper secondary um, school kids and they were really 
yeah, more like high achievers because um, they they had computer science electively at school and then they opted to go into this course, which also was um, part then of their final examination, uh, therefore quite important. And of course, there were students who were really engaged. But we're now going going down uh, with the material, trying to make it you know, um, focusing on the core elements and, and make the, the technical, the, the mathematical, the, the program technical things less um, ambitious. And um, we work quite closely with um, teachers and teachers tried out. And sometimes uh, some of our group um, can also go and, and visit what the teachers are doing. And we have some small evaluation also. And so far the feedback is um, that it works um, very well, even in uh, grade five and um, six. But we are still ongoing with the evaluation and we hope in some months we have more data. Okay, that's great. And what I did mean to say when I came back, um, Carson and I both meant to say is that Yannick, who maybe wants to wave, Yannick, <laughs> Yannick um, is also, um, he's said been working on the data cards project that, that um, Carson described. And Lucas, if I can see Lucas, you could wave. Lucas has been working on the data awareness um, project that um, Carson described. So if you have specific questions about those, um, then do uh um pose those to them particularly so um colin's asking about the artifacts and versus ideas um maybe for some clarity around is that your question colin I can't, what what you meant by the ideas and to explain that a little bit more yeah well i, I can try to ex 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 explain again so maybe within the german tradition there there we have the uh, um, concept of fundamental ideas of computer science. And I think the basic idea is we have always a tension between current products, um, the shape and form of the computers which are in, in the school or in the classroom at, at school, and the overarching ideas. So like we want to teach them bubble sort, but we have to implement it in a current um, programming language with, with some editor to type it in. and But those are uh, all add-ons and not as important, you can say, because it's the algorithm we are focusing on. And that's, I think, why the term ideas, not artifacts, was, was coined, especially with the, the experience we, we have that then the, the science goes away and we teach only how to use the computer. But I think we've gone too far so that nowadays, and that was the idea behind the man-machine example, that our school kids have problems in relating these very abstract ideas to the everyday world and, and to the technology they are using. And I think it's important that uh, computer science gives a background and, and fundamental stuff to understand the world we are living in. And it's a technology driven world. And so we need to find a balance between the ideas and the application to contemporary products. So my vision would be, sorry, I need to add, I hope I can add that, is like um, literature. So in literature, students learn uh, topics, metaphors, how um, the story is being told. But uh, the literature teachers are able to use all the time contemporary examples or very established, worthy examples from older literature. But they can ap apply it to, to current examples. And I think we should be able to do the same too. So to see the algorithms, the machine learning in current technologies. And it would be great if teachers would be able to design all the time new teaching material with, with this. But I think then computing education research needs to provide teachers with tools and resources to do so very quickly and efficiently. But that's where we should go. And that needs to be easy to use as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, technology will be ever more complex and probably easier to use, but we are shaped by technology and mm -hmm. we should also be understanders and shapers. Yes, and Jane's put in the chat about you know needing this link between theory and practice. 
Um, I'm going to switch between chat and hand. So, Julie, you've got your hand up. So do you want to ask a question that came up in your group? Yes, please. Um, but I don't know how I'm going to ask it. I've got to phrase it very carefully. Um, we had a, a, we had a very interesting um, discussion. Uh, we we didn't focus on questions one and two. We focused on three. Um, the change. Do we need to change the the patterns of teaching, um, or would the 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 concepts involved in and the teaching and the skills involved in artificial intelligence and machine learning fit into the way it is at the moment. And we, we shared our experiences of computing education as it is at the, the moment in our respective countries, uh, because there were, there were quite a number of countries um, represented. But it, um, <laughs> it seems as though there is a divide um, in maybe those, those students who are more privileged have a different education in terms of computer science than those who are underprivileged. It may well be that the teaching at the moment is not ideal for teaching computer science. And I was just wondering, um, or from the conversation that that's, we've just had, what's the experience in Germany? Um, and are there any lessons that we can learn from the German experience? So if I just say that at the moment, it's there is this digital divide in computing education. Um, what's the position in Germany? And what did you find out in your, in your research? <laughs> It's hard to say because it's so divided in, in, mm -hmm. in Germany. And um, yeah, maybe I can return the question. I know only quite old examples. And, and with the divide, it was um, a, quite a big issue of focus on, on the gender in, in balance at, in, in teaching and um, choosing uh, computer science as a subject. Um, but results are somewhat inconclusive with, it seems some exception that there was a time when, um, where we have mixed schools, but for the introductory classes in computing, they were divided into computer science for girls and computer science for boys. And that seemed to have worked quite well, but virtually every school I know um, got rid of this um, pattern. I don't know, maybe it's too complex to, to choose. And I know only a personal conversation with a, a study dean of a big um, university well known for, for computer science students. And he said that he always looks the, the applications for um, freshmen um, and that the girls they have um, or the female students are very often from um, from this part of the education system so that they had the chance to be, be on their own. But right now, to be honest, I think we can learn from your experiences, but we are just starting to have computer science as a mandatory subject for all in, in different um, of our Bundesländer. Thank you. Um I was switching to another question in the chat. I was going to ask Simon Johnson to say his question, but he's he's um, gone off camera, so maybe he's um, not there. But he, oh no, here he is. Simon, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, Sue. Sorry, I was just making the tea. <laughs> You're allowed. <laughs> um, so we 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 first explored question two, and we agreed that um, the. Focusing on the algorithms, especially when looking at AI, is a massive barrier, especially for, for young people. Uh, we also find that in the computing curriculum, full stop. However, accessing data and exploring data, one, is relevant to the children, but two, it's, it's more accessible. Um, so the question we were asking is, at what age would you start or would you say is a good age to start teaching about data science and do you think there's a limit or barrier? Well that's 
That's a good question. So in our project, uh, I said already, we started at the very end, uh, but we have um, um, some in our group, uh, Daniel Frischemeyer, he's a, a professor for primary education. And um, he thinks that when we um, spread our project, maybe we can also, or even go into, uh, into primary classrooms. And this uh, data cards idea, not with decision trees, but the idea of using data cards and get some impression of what is data, that data is measured and that there's some variability and measurement errors. I think that's even sort of established in, in primary schools and that could become a foundation for data science. And right now, we have this big experiment that is very quickly became mandatory. So right now we, we hope we will be able to, to collect data on how it works in grade, uh, in grade five and six. So when our kids are 11 year olds, our trial runs so far look promising, but uh, yeah, with this, what, what Julie said, with this divide between students and, and also maybe in, in different areas, I think it's very interesting to see what will happen. So in short, we're curious. I don't know if Yannick has something to add, but... I think you yeah, described it well. Uh, we, we tried it with 11 year olds with the data cards and some uh, uh, applications with Jupyter notebooks, very small and only with uh, some uh, yeah, uh, little, little experiments and seeing, okay, a machine can... Uh, can build a tree uh, itself, um, and yeah, we we, uh, we look forward to make uh, yeah further further uh, tries. Yes, and just to follow that up because um, I was talking to you about it earlier. Um, so you said you're using Jupyter notebooks with young with you know quite quite youngish sort of children. Do you think not not think that we need to develop new tools? for data science and AI that are more accessible to uh, younger children? Because I, you know, Jupyter Notebook is a tool that's created for you know, adults. It's got a lot of complexities in it. Um, should we be thinking about research in this area? Yeah, I think that's very interesting. So for a starter, we, um, we are also using an educational tool called uh, CodeUp, maybe. Mm -hmm. can, yeah. can present a link and where we also have contact to the developers. So they made, for example, a decision tree module for, for Coda. So that's then a web application where you can um, interactively um, click stuff together. But we also think the more and more we get our own experiences with Jupyter Notebooks, we can use these Jupyter Notebooks maybe as a kind of interactive school book. So design the, the notebooks and add um, um, graphical user interface that looks like a web app. And people probably don't even recognize that there's a Jupyter notebook behind. So the decision trees, I very briefly um, showed some more technical stuff that was a Jupyter notebook. And also we have seen the map and the ability to filter the, the location data that was also a Jupyter notebook. The vision would be that we can produce material that can be used as an interactive school book with tasks as is, but where teachers and probably also um, learners can go a step further and see also how that is done and how that works. So, so like different steps. Mm. Um, I see Chetna had, has a hand up or had a hand up. Oh, thank you, Sue. Can you hear me, Sue? Yes, I can hear you fine. Yeah, hi, Karsten. Um, see, my question, I mean, uh, already you've answered my question. I'm thankful that everybody has actually covered all the questions that we discussed in the group. But uh, one thing that I wanted to actually mention here, Karsten, is that when we are talking about children of age group 13 and 14, so uh, they are in a very sensitive uh, age group and they are actually learning to use things and uh, learning to apply, even if the mathematics concepts that we talk about they are not aware as to how they combine together and actually apply in the real world. So my uh, concern is that when we teach AI at this level, it's important that we uh, talk about uh, uh, 
uh, this being a tool to innovate and probably to help uh, uh, children or help people and not the only thing that has that would probably solve all the questions i mean this is a concern that i wanted to raise and because last uh, seminar was concerned with ai ethics so i guess um, while teaching this probably has to be integrated that children don't consider it as a tool to probably take all decisions they have to realize that human intervention is as important I mean, this is my concern thank you mm -hmm. thank you yeah thank you i think that's a that's a good point and interestingly right now we are kind of with i don't know by chance navigating that we are teaching younger and somewhat older but not but we expect to to be there also and yeah good point mm. thank you um oh i had a specific question but if lots of hands have appeared um catherine then jane thank you um we were talking particularly in our group about um, changes to teaching patterns. And we were specifically thinking about the slide that you showed for machine learning, which situated code as a small part of a big set of learning experiences. Um, it kind of seems seemed to us in our discussion that learning to code then became a tool um to give a specific to sort of provide a specific purpose for learning to code that might be sort of attractive to learners um mm -hmm. and sort of drive engagement and um, we were wondering if you'd seen um any of that in your sort of um in the research that you've been doing is is situating um code learning to code as a tool something which engages learners and, and drives them sort of to motivate them to want to learn these skills? Yeah, in, interesting question. So um, yeah, maybe as a disclaimer up front, uh, it seems sometimes I have the tendency to say, well, we have to exchange the pattern. I, I, I merely mean we can add to the pattern we already had. It's not that was wrong or we should not teach algorithm or programming the way we, we do. But in, in this area, we have new opportunities and we are currently exploring them. And I hope and think that's the case and that we can have a different take on, on programming. And actually we call that um, epistemic program or epistemic programming. You could call it also programming in order to understand the world. So data-driven programming, that's actually one active part in our project to, to design teaching units on different programming experiences for, for kids. Thank you. Um, Jane, you had a another point? Yeah, I just had a question. In When we're teaching children to write programs at the moment, we're really into code reading and tracing and predicting and all that kind of thing. But when there's a great big mass of data that's sitting underneath our kind of chair and, and that's what it's all going to be based on, do you have any ideas about how we might visualise or represent the data to help learners understand that side of things? Or is that a mad idea? <laughs> No, I think that's maybe even at the or, or a core issue. So in our project calls uh, pro is for for big data in, in the but well, to be honest, right now we're making our lives sort of somewhat easier. We, we go for these smaller examples. And right now we yeah, that's an open and very interesting issue that needs to be tackled. I don't know if we have really ideas there so far. But that's also a research question in, in the science itself. So, you know, the data visualization and, and all that stuff, that's maybe we could, yeah, good point. Yeah. And open. I mean, I can think that the, one of the reasons we've got this series of seven seminars, we wanted to kind of unpick what it is we should be teaching in these topics, you know, what age, what are the concepts we should be teaching, how we should be teaching them. There's a lot of open questions there. And I think, you know, it's really interesting to hear from Germany about what you're doing and that your specific examples, we all can't wait for them to be translated into English. Yannick and Lucas, little job for you there. 
Um, I'm going to take one more question because I think we're about running out of time. And I see a new hand. Um, Ashish, do you want to quickly ask your question? You can be the final question for the team. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm I'm Ashish Bularkar from Bhopal, and uh, I run a software company, and I am an enthusiast uh, in teaching kids and uh, uh, teaching them program about programming, etc. So my question is actually what I felt is uh, the uh, till now the in India, the uh, teaching was from a on a linear side. Like uh, we did kids, we asked them to develop some programs, some algorithms are there, and then they mm -hmm. learn the things. But now with the data driven kind of thing, the complete uh, concept is uh, uh, becoming different. So my yeah. take as to how to make uh, kids aware about these things. Uh, we had uh, uh, worked in uh, rural schools and we made them, we made the uh, kids aware about the things, the emerging technologies, etc. But we found that uh, uh, they used to, uh, the teachers used to ask us, us the questions, uh, is this the proper age to uh, teach the kids about AI or ML? So my question is the, what is the appropriate age and what is the things, what are the, what are your uh, experiences uh, that I would like to know? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's an open question. So when, when you said, so we, we have this um, system that kind of works to, to introduce uh, kids to, to, to programming with a, in this traditional way. And now this data-driven programming, however you would like to call it is different. Actually, we, we still have the discussion here, for example, in grade five and six, um, this new approach is included somewhat, but some people say, oh, why not start in the traditional way and add this new stuff later on and don't go to too, too low and leave that for, for the older ages. I, I think there's a lot of uh, research um, questions here. <laughs> So I, I can't really answer your question and I, I'm curious myself. Yeah, so no easy answers. But that brings us to the end um, of that uh, seminar. So can we just again do a big clap or virtual um, jazz hands um, wave for um, Carson and Yannick and Lucas, who've done a lot of the work in the background. Um, thank you very much indeed, really appreciated. Um, we've got a, um, I'm going to just put in the chat a quick plug, the Raspberry Pi has just released a course for educators on AI um, and machine learning. Uh, we've got a survey we'd like you to fill in after each seminar in this series, and the link is there, um, Diane has just put that up. Also, we have a newsletter that uh, you can sign up for, which we, we send out uh, quarterly, which tells us you know tells you what sort of things that uh, uh that you know our community might be interested in what's going on um and do share um any conversation going on from this um as um under the tweet the hashtag rpf seminars um thank you very much again to carsten and lucas and yannick uh, next month, at the beginning of November, we have Matti Tedra from the University of Eastern Finland coming to talk to us. And he's going to, we, everyone's addressing the same sort of topics that's from different angles. Um, he's looking at what the, the trajectories might be for to, trying to answer some of the open questions that we've been exploring today. Um, so it'd be really interesting to hear from him and Henrika Vatianen about their perspectives. And you can see on the slide all the other seminars that we have coming up until March. So um, on that note, um, you can turn off your mute buttons and say goodbye or thank you or whatever. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. And thank you very much thank for you. coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye